District Attorney, Mindy Templis. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm here to discuss the events surrounding the death of David Robinson as a result of an officer-involved shooting on May 7th of 2018. This was an extremely tragic event that impacted Mr. Robinson's family, the officers involved, their families, and the entire community. I want to express my condolences to the family of Mr. Robinson who have lost a husband, a father, and a son. While officers are trained to fire their weapon and use lethal force to protect themselves in the community, it is a decision they hope to never have to make. Incidents like these have a great impact on the officers, their families, and other responding officers that arrive on the scene, as well as an entire department. In assessing the circumstances, there's no question that the Appleton Police, Depar that Appleton Police Department uh, Sergeant Ryan Schrader, Officers Nathan Hoffman, Brandon Schneezy, Frank Weikram, and Tom Zeman intended to shoot Mr. Robinson. I also conclude the evidence demonstrates that the officers believe that when they fired their weapons that they believed Mr. Robinson was engaged in behavior that threatened the lives of themselves and others in the neighborhood. The question that must be addressed in determining whether criminal charges are appropriate against the officers is not whether they were right and correct in their beliefs, but, whether, but rather whether the actions were objectively reasonable and justifiable under Wisconsin law. Pursuant to Wisconsin statute, the Green Bay Police Department was called to investigate this case. While Lieutenant Bellinger was assigned as the lead, investiga lead investigator in this case, additional officers and investigators from the Green Bay Police Department, the Wisconsin State Patrol, and the Outagamie County Sheriff's Department also assisted. I want to sincerely thank them each for their and their departments, and especially the Green Bay Police Department, for making this a priority and for conducting thorough investigations. Anytime law enforcement officers use deadly force, it's critical to have a thorough, objective, and transparent investigation conducted in order to maintain the integrity of the law enforcement in the community and the community's confidence in the result of the investigation. Because that it integrity and transparency is so important, I believe the Appleton Police Department is prepared to provide the public records available at the conclusion of our press conference today for you. I want to thank the Department of Justice and Crime Lab for their professionalism and expeditious analysis of the firearms and ballistics involved in this case, which allowed us to be able to provide this information to you as soon as today. I also want to thank the Milwaukee Medical Examiner's Office for their work in providing us a final autopsy diagnosis and for Trooper Jason Schwartz for the scene mapping that he did to assist us. At this time, the only information we're missing are the final toxicology results of Mr. Robinson, as those results often take weeks to test and analyze, to analyze and the testing of one remaining shell casing. However, that information would not affect my legal analysis regarding criminal charges today. When conducting a legal analysis of this case, there is no one recording, interview, or piece of evidence that answers all the questions related to this incident. Rather, it is necessary to review the entire investigation with all the reports, interviews, evidence, videos, 911 calls, and diagrams to understand the events of that evening. I also want, conducted a review of Wisconsin law relating to the exercise of the privilege of self-defense and the defense of others. After consideration of all available evidence and assessment of applicable legal, legal rules and principles, I conclude that Sergeant Ryan Schrader and Officers Nathan Hoffman, Brandon Schneezy, Frank Weikram, and Tom Zeman acted in an objectively reasonable manner and were justified in their use of deadly force based upon their perceived threat of imminent death or great bodily harm to themselves and others by David Robinson. Thus, no criminal charges will be issued against any of the officers. My t determination today only relates to criminal charges, as I would not be able to overcome the affirmative defense of self-defense or defense of others available in a criminal trial against a person who uses deadly force. For the reasons I will set forth, if charges were issued, the state would not prevail or be able to meet its burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, which is our responsibility at trial. The use of deadly force is an affirmative defense to homicide. A person lawfully engaged in self-defense or defense of others is privileged under Wisconsin law to utilize deadly force under certain specified circumstances. 
Wisconsin jury instructions, which define the privilege, direct that the reasonableness of officers' actions be judged from the standpoint of an ordinary, prudent, and reasonably intelligent person in the officer's position, having the knowledge and training that the officers possessed and acting under the circumstances that existed at that time. That means we are, that we may only consider the information available to the officers at the time that they made their decision to use deadly force. Any circumstances about which they were unaware would be irrelevant. It also means the fact that officers have received specialized training that is not typical available to average citizens is a relevant consideration. I will summarize the significant factual evidence and analysis which I applied to those facts in an effort to explain how I arrived at this opinion. It is important to recognize that the video captured from the officer's body cameras does not capture what the officers were seeing because unlike a stationary video camera, these devices were fixed to officers' uniforms and the officers were in constant state of motion, bent down and taking cover. No camera captured a clear view of the officer's observations of Mr. Robinson. On May 7th of 2018, a neighbor arrived home on Matthias Street with his young children around 5.15 in the evening when he heard a, hu a huffing noise as if someone fell. He saw Mr. Robinson lying on a concrete stoop in the back door and went over there to try to see if he needed something. When he arrived near Mr. Robinson, he recalled seeing a syringe in the front of his chest and a bottle of alcohol on the stoop next to him. The neighbor believed he was highly intoxicated due to his behavior, his physical appearance, and the bottle. Mr. Robinson made statements if statements he was going to jail for a couple years and didn't do anything wrong. Mr. Robinson then made an obscene gesture and comment to the neighbor who then returned to his family home. Shortly thereafter, Mrs. Robinson, David's wife, reports she arrived home at 5.30 and could immediately tell Mr. Robinson had been drinking. She said they talked about what a nice day it was, and he began telling her that he was tired of dealing with a myriad of health issues he had been suffering from over the last 10 years. Those would include surgeries, a colostomy bag, external ports, feeding tubes, and medications. Mrs. Robinson indicated she had previously hid firearms about a year ago, as he had talked about ending his life in the past. She said he was not happy with police because of a pending criminal case for two counts of possession with intent to deliver narcotics and a civil forfeiture action arising out of that criminal case. Mr. Robinson then began talking about getting one of his guns to end it all and said he knew where she had hid the guns. She tried to talk to him, talk him out of getting the guns and stood in the, front, in the doorway to try to prevent him from going inside. She that, he then moved her arm and went into the residence and she called a mutual friend to come over and ask him to help her talk to him. When she saw Mr. Robinson start to access one of the guns under the bed in a bedroom, she then contacted 911. As a result, Mrs. Robinson was able to give the dispatcher specific information regarding Mr. Robinson's actions, movements, and movements, including taking the gun with him to the garage in order to get ammunition. This information was then relayed to officers as they responded to the scene. Mrs. Robinson followed him outside, but was told by the 911 operator to go back in the house, lock all the doors, and remain in a safe place of the house. At one point, Mrs. Robinson could see Mr. Robinson through the front living room window holding the long gun with one hand, the barrel pointing up. She could hear him yelling and thought he saw her, but could not make out what he said. The dispatcher then advised her to move to a bedroom in the back of the house where she then laid on a bed. She heard gunshots and continued talking to the, office, to the operator, her dispatcher, until officers entered her residence and moved her to a safe location away from the house. At approximately 6 o'clock is when Appleton Police Department responded to that weapons complaint at 112 South Messias, Messias in the city of Appleton. As Mrs. Robinson was providing live information to dispatch, dispatch officer, officers were able to be given critical information related to their response. Officers were aware Mr. Robinson was on scene with a gun and they were receiving information. He was waving the gun around the house and telling people he was going to the garage to load it. As responding officers began to carefully plan their response, they received information he was then in the front of the house with a loaded weapon. <laughs> 
Officers Zeman, Schneezy, and Sergeant Schrader first arrived and grabbed their rifles from their squad cars. All of the responding officers arrived in full police uniforms. Officer Zeman was most familiar with that neighborhood and led the officers down the west side of the road in order to have an unobstructed view of Mr. Robinson and the residents on the east side of the road. While they approached, dispatch was notifying them that Mr. Robinson had a loaded shotgun and was waiting out in front of the house for some undisclosed reason. As officers arrived, they could hear a male, male party, eventually identified as Mr. Robinson, yelling before they were able to visually see him due to a tree on the south end of the front yard. Officers began to slow their approach, and as they got closer to the residence, they could hear, they could see a male with a weapon pointing directly at them. Officers called out a warning, and they quickly took cover. Officer Zeman took cover behind a vehicle and had at that point been joined by Officer Hoffman. Officer Schneezy and Sergeant Schrader hid behind a tree in a front yard. At this point, Officer Hoffman had joined them, and the officers could, see, could clearly see Mr. Robinson waving what was clearly described as a shotgun or rifle at them. The officers identified themselves as police officers and began to yell commands. Drop your weapon, told him to drop his weapon multiple times and to show them his hands. This was confirmed by neighbors in nearby residences, but was never actually done or any commands followed by Mr. Robinson. He did not comply with those demands, but continued to yell words at, quote, shoot me, quote, kill me, quote, I'm loading this but was hard to understand and appeared to sound intoxicated. It was clear Mr. Robinson was yelling directly at and aware of the police officer's presence. Simultaneously, he was waving the shotgun around and even held it underneath his chin at one point while continuing to yell at officers. At this point, officers were about 55 yards away from him. At that time, Officer Schneezy was identified to communicate with Mr. Robinson so there could be a clear point of communication and one assigned officer. As he began talking to him, he was trying to talk him down in the hopes of de-escalating the situation and having him put his gun down. Officer Sneezy told him he wanted to talk to him and he wanted to work it out, but that he needed to drop the weapon. Officers Zeman, Hoffman, and Sneezy were providing lethal coverage as, he still had, as Mr. Robinson still had the shotgun. Officers were concerned about the safety of the citizens in the immediate area. It was shortly again after 6 p.m. on a beautiful night where people had been out and about, arriving home from work, and kids and families had been outside. Due to the proximity of the residences situated very closely together in that neighborhood, officers were also concerned that if any shots were fired, they could easily penetrate vehicles and homes in the area. During this time, Mr. Robinson was still holding the shotgun and pointing him at himself at times. Then Officer Zeman heard him yell, quote, I'm loading it. Officers reported seeing him open the action of the shotgun and clearly hearing it. At that point, officers observed him rack the shotgun and say, and Mr. hear Mr. Robinson say that he charged it or racked it. This gave the officers much more concern as they believed that he had just put a shell in the chamber. Mr. Robinson then began to shoulder and swing the weapon in the direction of a, resi of a residence and then at the officers. At that moment, officers were immediately concerned for their own life the lives of each other, and the real possibility of Mr. Robinson discharging a round into the, ho the house across the street. Officer Zeman saw him look directly at officers and was in the process of shouldering his gun and lifting the muzzle in the direction towards officers. On the other side of the street, Officer Wykram was two houses down from Mr. Robinson's house with a different vantage point. He could see Mr. Robinson move the shotgun slide with his left hand while his right hand was on the trigger guard. He then saw him place his eye down the sight level as if he was acquiring a target. He feared for the safety of his fellow officers and the lives of anyone in the neighborhood or in the homes. At that time, all five officers discharged their weapons for approximately three to four seconds to stop the threat of Mr. Robinson. Officers stopped firing as soon as Mr. Robinson fell backwards and dropped the weapon as he was no longer a threat. They then immediately began to prepare to render aid by putting on gloves, calling for the ambulance, and carefully approaching the residents. These five officers were also joined by other officers where they attempted to render aid to Mr. Robinson immediately and locate Mrs. Robinson, the reporting party, who was still on the phone inside the house with dispatch. 
Mrs. Robinson was then taken to a safe location while officers began their investigation. We received information from the Milwaukee County uh, Medical Examiner who was able to confirm that there were 10 gunshot wounds that Mr. Robinson suffered. Officers through their investigation determined that 12 rounds were fired and that 12 shell casings were in fact located. Three rounds were covered during the autopsy of Mr. Robinson. One near his abdomen shot by Officer Schneezy, one gunshot wound to his torso and neck area also shot by Officer Schneezy, and one gunshot wound to his torso and neck shot by Officer Hoffman. Additional gunshot wounds where the bullets were not recovered in Mr. Robinson, but sometimes located in fragments and other areas around that area, were in the upper right arm, a, a wound his right ring finger, his right little finger, his left upper arm, right thigh, right lower leg, and a graze to his left lower leg. In looking at the illegal analysis, there is no question that officers intentionally shot and killed David Robinson on May 7, 2018. Wisconsin acknowledges the privilege as a defense to other, otherwise criminal conduct where a privilege by statute in this case is self-defense. Because the evidence establishes that officers saw Mr. Robinson armed with a shotgun and believed he was going to shoot at them, any criminal charge against them would be met with that affirmative defense. A jury would be instructed after the elements of the crime and before reaching a conclusion of guilt on the privilege of self-defense. The jurors would be instructed that the law of self-defense allows a person to use intentional force against another if that person believed there was an actual, imminent, unlawful interference with his person. The amount of force used was necessary to prevent or terminate that interference, and those beliefs were reasonable. The jurors would also be instructed that a defendant may intentionally use force intended to cause death or great bodily harm only if he reasonably believed that the force was necessary to prevent imminent death, great bodily harm to himself or to others. The jury instruction defines reasonable beliefs as a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time of the defendant's actions in a criminal case and not from the viewpoint of the jury at trial. The jury is instructed to consider only what a reasonable person would have believed, but to make this determination from the standpoint of the person that would be charged. If the state the state then is required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense. The jury is instructed to find the defendant not guilty if they find he acted in self-defense and if the state has not proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The United States Supreme Court says that in judging the reasonableness of a particular use of a force, the focus must be from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than the 2020 vision of hindsight. The law recognizes that officers are forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. Officers are trained that an imminent threat is an immediate threat or a threat about to happen. To be considered imminent, there must be three criteria met, and which were met in this case. The subject, David Robinson, must indicate his intent to cause great bodily harm or death to that person or someone else. In this case, Officers heard Mr. Robinson say he loaded his gun, watched Mr. Robinson rack the gun and charged it, observed him swing the gun up and point it at officers, saw him move the shotgun to where the action of the shotgun was in his left hand, saw his right hand on the trigger guard, and saw him place his eye down the sight level as if he was acquiring a target. Second, the subject must have a weapon capable of inflicting great bodily harm or death. A shotgun can certainly do that. And finally, the subject must have a means of using a weapon to inflict harm. In this case, he had a shotgun and he was clearly able to point directly at officers. Officers are instructed that in many deadly force situations, they will not have time or the ability to try other options. Officers are trained that their judgment in deadly force situation is based on the totality of circumstances. If a subject points a firearm at you with a clear intent to shoot you, you are justified in using deadly force. Even if the suspect's gun later is determined to be unloaded, that does not render the decision unjustified as the perception of the threat was reasonable under the circumstances at the time. 
So when we look at the application of the law to the facts, the questions in this case include, did the officers reasonably believe that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with their person or another, their officers in the community? And was the amount of force they used necessary to prevent the term and or terminate that interference? And my conclusion is that in fact occurred. Did the officers reasonably believe that the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to themselves or others? Yes, they believe there was an imminent threat to themselves, each other, and the surrounding neighbors. If the, the third question is the, if the officers were charged with the killing of David Robinson, could the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the officer in question did not act lawfully in self-defense? And I conclude no. These actions were put into motion by David Robinson. The officers who responded to that call did so to protect the citizens in our community. They risked their own lives and exemplified a high degree of training and professionalism in their response in mere seconds. Certainly, this is not the outcome they wished for and something they will carry with them the rest of their lives. Again, I want to express what a tragedy this is for everyone involved and want to remind people that if they know someone or they themselves are struggling with depression or thinking of harming themselves, we are a community-rich resource. Please call or encourage that person to call Outagamie County Crisis to seek help through a medical provider, a therapist, or contact other resources within our community ready to help. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'll just be real brief on uh, Monday, May 7th, 2018, approximately 6 uh, PM, the Green Bay Police Department was requested to respond to uh, an officer involved shooting in the city of Appleton. Um, our normal response uh, was contacted, normal homicide response was contacted, and we responded to the scene. Within about an hour of the incident, um, the scene had been stabilized and held by the Appleton Police Department. I'll turn it over to Chief Tom. Um, a lot of my comments are going to just echo the district attorney's uh, comments. Uh, <clears throat> this was a tragic incident. It's dramatically impacted the lives of many people. Most affected are Mr. Robinson's family and friends who are struggling with their loss and the five police officers and their family members who are forced to deal with something they hope they would never have to experience. We thank the lead investigating agency, the Green Bay Police Department, for their quick response and the timely and professional investigation they did. We thank the other agencies that assisted, including the Wisconsin State Patrol and the Outagamie County Sheriff's Office. We also want to thank the Wisconsin Department of Justice Crime Lab and the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office for their expedient work in this incident. We thank District Attorney Templis and her staff for making the review of this incident a priority. We all know how important it is to provide accurate information to the public as quickly as possible when these incidents occur. We believe we have a process in place to quickly get answers for the family, the officers, and the community without compromising the integrity of the investigation. I also want to commend the dispatchers and the communications center operators who handled this call. They are a police officer's lifeline during these incidents, and they all performed exceptionally well. We also want to thank our contracted mental health provider, Zeman Counseling and Wellness, for responding the night of the incident to be with the officers and for providing follow-up services to our staff and their families. I've read the reports and reviewed the body camera video. The body cameras, again, proved to be extremely valuable. Even though it's difficult to see the subject, and we must always remember they only show one perspective of an incident, the video showed the speed at which these things happen. A split-second decision had to be made in the most stressful of situations. The responding officers performed exceptionally well, not only in addressing the threat, and following through to provide aid, but by remaining vigilant and focused until Mrs. Robinson was located and the scene was secured. The officers then compassionately cared for the family members that arrived and assisted them during what was surely one of the most difficult times of their lives. These officers truly lived up to our core values, and this community is lucky to have such compassionate and courageous people serving them as police officers. I will also end by reminding anyone who may be struggling with thoughts of harming themselves to reach out to someone. There are many different types of community resources available to you. If you feel like a family member or a friend is contemplating harming themselves, please be courageous, talk to them about your concerns, and persuade them to talk to somebody. At this time, we will take some questions. Have the officers returned to patrol duty, active duty, I guess? I think they're on administrative duty. 
Correct. They're on administrative duty. They will cycle back into a patrol uh, service uh, at, at different points, different times. So are they doing, as you said, you know, it's yeah. traumatic for everybody involved. Right. Thanks for asking. Um, they are doing as well as can be expected. Uh, this is one of those situations that we train for. It's a scenario we train for often. Um, we have to thank our trainers. Uh, some of them are in the room, uh, but it really was training that kicked in. Uh, they are responding as uh, as can be expected, and we'll continue to work with them. Have you reached out to the family? Has the department done anything? Um, I guess, how are they doing? Do you guys know? Um, I had the opportunity to also meet. I met with the family. They were part of the investigation. Um, certainly, I had an opportunity to meet with them. They obviously are certainly struggling with the loss of um, Mr. Robinson, and you know, this is a very difficult time for them as well. Are they satisfied with the investigation that was conducted into the, into the incident? And we, you, you talked to them before you talked to us. We've, we made the information available to them and allowed them to ask questions that they had to, certainly Mrs. Robinson was there and you know, there are parts that she's well aware of and parts she didn't know was going on. And so we made that opportunity available to them and answered all the questions that they had. Was his shotgun in fact loaded? No. How many times did he get hit? Uh, he had 10 wounds to him. Uh, some of them are through and through and some of them um, perhaps have bounced off of uh, the cement porch that he was on, but there were 12 wounds that, or 10 wounds rather that he had. And it was on the, that front porch, because the side porch is where the neighbor had encountered him and Correct. his wife had encountered him when he went into the house, went to the garage and then went to that front. Correct. Front and when officers had contact with him, he was at the, on the front stoop. Did you find that syringe that the neighbor said was there? Yes. Any other questions? As the uh, district attorney mentioned, we do have a copy of the report available for you. Uh, it is fully redacted. Um, as you leave, you can grab a copy. There are also two DVDs that are attached to each of the paper copies. That is all the videos. Um, there's a letter there from uh, Assistant City Attorney Darren Glad explaining what's been redacted and why. Um, you will see a letter there also that has my statement. So. All right, thank you for coming.